Well, as we begin this morning, I did find a, a story uh, about uh, this, there was this, one of these restaurants that you know provided some entertainment for people while they were waiting for food, and they had this magician that would walk around to all the tables and do card tricks and little sleight of hand things and bring out handkerchiefs and make stuff appear, disappear, all that kind of stuff. And he's kind of uh, wowing the tables, and he goes to this one particular family. He does this, he does this uh, trick, and the father spoke up and says, wow, that was incredible. Can you tell me how he, you did that? The man says, well, you know, the magician can never reveal this, his secrets. If I told you how I did it, then I would have to kidnap you and take you away. And the man replied, oh, in that case, could you tell the secret to my mother-in-law? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, cultivate. It means to grow, to, 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 you know, in your garden or uh, any work that you do with flowers, something like that. You know what it means to cultivate, to help them grow. And we recognize that you can't just walk out to a tree or a plant or a flower or anything and just say, you know, grow, produce fruit, snap your fingers and, and have it be so. It takes time. It takes preparation. Growth is a, it, it takes a while. And so it is in any area of your life. You have to, you know, grow your business. You grow your marriage. You grow your children. You grow your knowledge. Um, and so it is as you grow and allow the Holy Spirit to, to, to grow the fruits of God within your heart. Today's uh, fruit, as we continue on through our list, is the fruit of gentleness. Older translations use the word meekness, and um, we're going to use the word gentleness today. And as we have been looking at these cultural comparisons, what does it look like to try to develop or allow to grow a divine character, a godly trait within our lives, in our hearts? And what does it look like as far as what's happening in the world today? And so our question for today is, how can we cultivate gentleness in a culture of judgmentalism. Consider that. Now let's understand what gentleness is. Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology, there's a mouthful already, said this, gentleness is sensitivity of disposition and kindness of behavior founded on strength and prompted by love. It's really interesting, um, and, and like all the other fruits, we probably have this immediate idea of what, it, what the fruit means, but then when we see it within biblical context, it has such a deeper meaning. And that's what he's saying here, that yes, gentleness is sensitivity. Yes, it's kindness. It's a certain softness. But it's, it's based upon, it's founded upon strength. In other words, gentleness is when I use my love and my strength to show sensitivity and kindness. I, I don't know about you, but I guess my first idea of gentleness is, is almost like weakness. It's interesting the, that we used to word, use the word meekness and how meekness and weakness, they, they sound so similar. It's, it's probably really unfortunate because it gives us the wrong picture. But I think I often think of that little old lady that's soft-spoken, you know, and, and just serves her family, has been so faithful, never raises a voice or a hand, uh, you know, always has candy in her purse for the kids. I mean, <laughs> gentleness is kind of what I think of. I, I, have, I have one grandmother that was gentle and one grandmother that was, uh, a little, uh, was a little stern, more stern on the stern side. Um, now, that might be a manifestation of gentleness, but it fails to grasp the fullness of this word and what it truly means to be gentle within, um, within God's biblical understanding. In Galatians 5 passage that has inspired this sermon series, the word that's used for gentleness is parates. Now the root, the P-R-A, the pra, it denotes or indicates that it has a divine origin. This fruit it, it, it seems to indicate more than any of the other ones. It comes from only from God. And it, and it implicates that this fruit only comes from God, and it's when we learn how to show strength and power with reservation and gentleness. 
Gentleness, then, is an attitude of restrained strength. It's when we act in such a way that out of our strength and out of our our character, out of our godliness, we are able to respond appropriately to the situation. A guy by the name of Andy Mort wrote that there is nothing strong about the person who is quick to lose their temper and resort to aggression and violence in their spirit, words, and actions. This is anything but strength. And it is, in fact, a display of profound weakness. I would agree. Wouldn't you agree? When people are angry, when they're violent, when they're careless with their words, when they're explosive, they're actually demonstrating weak character and not strength in character. Uh, By way of example, consider an animal that is probably considered the most gentle giant in all the world. They're the largest and strongest animal to, to walk the earth. It's the elephant. They're an incredible example of gentleness. They have the strength to carry nearly 20,000 pounds. That's approximately the weight of 130 average, uh, average size adults. The African air, uh, elephant is strong enough to lift up another elephant with a single tusk. The elephant's trunk, the trunk in particular, is is an incredible example of of strength. Elephants can rip apart trees, rip apart uh, branches. They have over 100,000 individual muscles in their trunk. And yet, they are able to pick up a single blade of grass with the dexterity of their trunk. That's an incredible display of gentleness. They have great, they've been used throughout time in many different cultures, many different ways for, for great feats of strength to be able to move and, uh, you know, stone and, and trees and, and whatever they would have them to do. Yet they are easily domesticated because they're so gentle. Now I said that, um, I, I want you to have those, uh, those, those images in your mind. What are, that gentleness is actually about strength that's used in the proper way. And so, as we think about that, um, we're actually going to take what might seem like a bit of a left turn. Um, but by way of reminder, I want to say that I've been reading a book, Cultivate, Cultivating the Fruits of the Spirit by Christopher Wright. And I've also been reading or watching an outline, a video series um, called Cultivate by Pastor Steve Carter out of Willow Creek. And I've been using kind of his outline. Well, as uh, they actually, in their series, they skipped the fruit of gentleness for whatever reason. And uh, because this was over the summer that they did this, and they had Dr. Henry Cloud come in and speak for a couple of weeks and do some teaching. And I thought what he taught on, uh, actually called it cultivating grace, I think it fits so perfectly in this fruit of gentleness. And so the following outline is actually what Dr. Cloud talked about during this series. And it's out of Luke chapter 13. I invite you to open that up if you haven't already. The beginning of this chapter is kind of, uh, kind of interesting, confusing. It has a lot to discuss and look at. And, and, I, and it would easy, be easy to get lost in it. So I'm not going to read the first couple of verses. But I'd like to say that in the opening chapter of Luke 13, uh, in the end of chapter 12, there's been some discussion. And it seems to continue on as if people approach Jesus. And they seem to be complaining about a certain group of people. They start with the Galatians. They, they complain with the Galatians, who apparently were known as hotheads and ones that stirred up trouble. Um, they were often causing problems with the Romans, and there seems as though there was some incident where there was even the, the soldiers came in and they, they uh, got into a tussle with these Galatians, and, um, and they, they were even killed. It's interesting that Jesus compares them to some innocent bystanders who were recently killed in a tragic building collapse. I never really noticed that before. He, he says that there was this tower that fell down and it killed a bunch of people. I mean, they're kind of going through the same kind of life stuff that we see and that we're, we're living in. And he's comparing that here's these two groups of people. One group that were killed because of their kind of violent outbreak. And here's another group of people that were killed because they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And his point was that everyone needs the same thing in life. Repentance and forgiveness. And he tells an interesting parable in verse, beginning at verse 6. 
to kind of illustrate how we should think about people and what's going on around us. So in verse, uh, verse 6, uh, Luke 13, he says this, And Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig, a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. He said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if, I should, then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. And if not, you can cut it down. And so Jesus tells us this, this parable, and let's unpack this a little bit, and the, the, the process that Jesus walks his listeners through in understanding this story and what he's trying to teach them. First of all, you recognize that the vineyard owner comes in with an expectation. He, had an, he expected that when he came to look at this, this tree, that it would have fruit growing on it. That's why he planted the fruit. That's what he expected from the fruit. It's what he needed from the, the fruit. And he's checking on it here. And of course he expected there to be fruit to be out. Why wouldn't he? Now, uh, now he did not plant the, the, the tree and then come back the next day expecting that there'd be fruit the next day. He came back three years later. This tree had been growing for three years. And so it was a reasonable expectation. By now it should have had sufficient time to begin producing good fruit. And he expected it so. Pretty natural. It's interesting that in life we all have expectations about how life should go. Um, I, went to, I went and got a haircut this week and I used their online check-in. And I expected that I would be next in line when I got there. And so I got there and I was actually at this point now the only person seated, seated um, in the waiting area my name was clearly on the computer screen saying that I had checked in. I was waiting. I was ready to go. And um, a guy walked through the door and walked up to the counter and a, and a stylist came over and picked him up and said, um, you know, are you here for a haircut, blah, blah, blah. And says, okay, well, follow me. And she took him right back. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I was dumbfounded. I couldn't believe it. I was next in line. I expected to be taken next. I had things to do. We, we all have expectations. Maybe you expect your kids to go to school every day. Or you expect uh, to be able to pick up your full paycheck on Friday. You uh, expect that the cashier or the sales clerk that's helping you will treat you kindly and be polite and nice and maybe glad that you're there. <laughs> It's, and we get frustrated when our expectations aren't met, just like the vine, the, the vineyard owner. You know, on and on. These, and, and the reason is frustrating. The reason we have this reaction is because these are reasonable expectations. It's normal. This is the way it ought to be. And this is a really good point for us to consider. Thank God for expectations. What would life be like without them? We're kind of starting to find out in our culture, we have an insanity growing in our culture that in the name of tolerance, the best thing to do is lower expectations. In, 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 a, in a culture of, you know, uh, you know, just be nice and just get along and everybody's okay, you're okay, I'm okay. The idea is to lower all expectations because they're unfair or embarrassing. Ideas like it's normal or ethical or high expectations are actually stifling to personal development. It's just craziness. Expectations are good. We have people today that think that they're enlightened or better off because they have no expectations. Oh, I just love everybody. You know, just go along to get along. That's the way it should be. But is that really how life works? Are we really better off by having no expectations? Is that how we get along with one another? Is that how we're successful and help make our culture and our, our environment better? All the research shows that children that grow up at home with high expectations coupled 
with loving support have the best chance of excelling in life? What happens when um, kids have high expectations without consistency and love? Well, they become stressed out. They get insecure. There's a lot of brokenness and abandonment issues that, that can, get, can grow with inside them. But what, a kid, what about kids with no expectations? They have no boundaries. They have no discipline in their life. Their parents are only around to yell at them or something like that. Other than that, they just let them go. Well, you're raising holy terrors. Starved for attention. End up in detention. You meet, ever meet some of those kids? You see, expectations are good. And we have to get rid of this thinking that people deserve everything that they want and they don't have to do anything for it. That's not God's economy. That's not what he said how we, or how we should live. It's normal to expect your children to finish all their homework. It's normal to expect that your, your spouse should treat you with dignity and respect. It's normal to expect that your coworkers will do their job. It's normal to expect that hard work is rewarded fairly. It's normal to expect that God rewards good fruit and he punishes unrepented people and their behaviors. Those are all normal expectations. Now, second of all, what happens in our story? There's a legal response from the vineyard owner. Now, what do we mean by that? I think you kind of get the idea. When the vineyard owner came and and he looked at this tree that he expected to have fruit on it. He expected to find figs there. And he didn't. And he felt that he had waited a reasonable amount of time. He said, well, this is no good. This isn't working. Cut it down. I need the space. I need the soil for a tree that's going to actually do uh, the, the work that's actually going to produce the fruit. He'd waited his time and he needs trees that will produce the fruit. This is about his business. This affects his, this affects his product. This affects his payroll. This affects uh, his, his ability to make profit. All, all of it is affecting his bottom line. And hey, what if the other trees get wind of what's going on and they decide they don't have to produce fruit either? I mean, this could go bad. Or there might be a reason that the tree's not producing fruit and there's a disease or something. It's reasonable that the owner would look at this and have the response that he did because he needs the real estate for a tree that's going to produce fruit. He wants to put his time and his effort into something that's going to work. And so he comes and he looks and he sees a tree with no fruit and he has a legal response. He says, cut it down. That's the right thing to do. And he had a right to do that. It all makes sense and so on. You see, there's a natural judgment on what should be done based upon the expectations of every situation. It is, a, it is a sense that I have every right to evaluate what to do in a situation based upon what's right, what is just, what is reasonable, what makes sense according to the expectations that you have. And so when the, when the lady took the the, the client ahead of me at the haircutting place and the next stylist came up and said, oh, I'm sorry, were you waiting for a haircut too? I was well within my rights to uh, put that disdain in my yes answer because <laughs> that was a legal response. I gave her a legal response. Well, yes, of course I'm waiting. Yeah, right. You bet. Should have gave her a piece of my mind, but I needed a little bit left for this morning, so I didn't. <laughs> That's why we have these reactions, these thoughts, these feelings. Um, and they're well within... The, these re yeah, they meet a certain legal requirement. They do make a certain sense. But the story doesn't end there. Jesus' story, if we think that that's the way God wants us to respond or wants us to act, then we don't finish the story. Because the third thing that happens is that there was an advocate for the tree that spoke up. 
This is the vine dresser. This is the gardener, the one that works out in the field. And he says, wait, 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 wait. I understand you have every right. I understand you, you're worried about your bottom line. I understand you need this tree to produce fruit. And if it won't, you need another one. But wait, I'll work with it one more year. I'm going to do some extra stuff. I've got some ideas. I think we can still save this. I think in the long run, it's actually going to help uh, everything. Instead of waiting another three more years on another tree, we can maybe get this one to come back in just a year. It says, don't give up on it. Give me one more tier, one more year. I'll work on it. I can help. And with his willingness and with his knowledge and, and, and knowing the problem and he's got the focus, he can he feels he can go in and he can do something to help. He advocates for this tree. And how we need an advocate in our lives, of course, Chris, uh, uh, of course first of all, Jesus is our advocate. And are we glad that he's advocated for us and stood in the place of punishment that we deserve? Aren't we glad that when God says the legal response for sin is death? But Jesus steps, steps up and says, whoa, wait, 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 wait. Let me work with them. Let me show them the way. Let me take the punishment for their transgressions. Let me be an example. Let me help them. And watch and see if good fruit will come out. Oh, we should be so thankful that Jesus is our advocate. Without him, we're lost. Without him, we stand before the judge accused. Without him, he looks, God, God could, has every legal right to look at us and say, there's no fruit in your life. Cut it down. You know, Veterans Day, I thought, was kind of an example of this. How many freedoms do we enjoy that we have not earned? How much protection and provision? How much have they done for us that we could not do for ourselves. Those men and women that have served and sacrificed and laid their lives on the line to protect our country from evil threats. That did what we couldn't do for ourselves. To keep us safe. To help us to continue to have the life that we have. They've advocated on our behalf and stood in a place where maybe some of us could not have stood. But what does it look like in the church as well? What does it mean for us to be advocates for those that don't yet have godly character and fruit growing in their lives? Now I want to give you two different kinds of church models. And I'll say the first church model I give you is actually the church model that I kind of am most familiar with and I grew up in. Um, and it makes sense. It's, it's, the, uh, it's, the, it's a model. I think it's, I would even go so far as to suggest that this is the, the um, prefer, pre preferred model, the most common model um, throughout our age. And it's a, it's a sense that if you want to belong to our church, then you need to believe the way we believe. You need to understand what we teach. You need to understand our theology. You need to understand our doctrines. And you need to agree with that. And second of all, because of what we believe, you're responsible for how you behave. <laughs> and you have to behave the way we behave. And if you don't behave the way we behave, then you don't really fit in. And so once you believe the way we believe, and once you behave the way we, be we behave, then you are able to belong. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that sounds a little familiar. I've seen that before. I've lived in that before. And it's really hard for people to break in to church life. If you haven't grown up in it, and you, you don't understand it, and you're not there yet, you, you haven't gone that far, you haven't grown that way. And a lot of people come in and they feel like what we do and the, the way we act and what we say and what we expect is like we're a foreign country. And we say, well, yeah, we are. We're foreigners. We're strangers in a foreign land. That's the way it's supposed to be. Sorry. But I want to suggest that the way Jesus did it and the way that this story proclaims it 
And, and, and the way we see that the church grew is they first allowed people to belong. Jesus said, follow me. Watch me, walk with me, listen to me, do what I do. And he allowed them to be in the family. And some of these guys, these guys had no clue what was going on. They walked with Jesus for years and still at the end of his life and mission, they still didn't understand what he was doing. They, they didn't get it. They didn't, they didn't believe correctly. They didn't behave correctly. They didn't understand what was going on, but they belonged. And he let them be with him and watch him and learn from him. And, and then he had them you know, start doing things like he did things. And he would say, okay, I want you to go out and I want you to do this. Okay, we're going we're gonna to minister like this. I want you to help me minister. We're, you know, we're, we're going to serve people and I want, I, wanna, I want you to help me do this. And he started having them do certain things and behave certain ways. That, that would match up. And then he'd come back and he'd do a teaching. And then he noticed all these times Jesus got off to the side with his disciples. And he said, okay, what I just told them, this is what it means. And he started unpacking it in their lives. And he started working on the behaviors. And it, it, and it wasn't until later on that they started to believe. And they actually became what he wanted them to become. It's really hard and messy to do church and life like that. <laughs> and we get it wrong a lot. But I think we're actually, we understand this. I think we really try. We really try to live this way in our church. But I think we got to keep it in front of us because it's so easy to switch this around and forget why we're, he why we're here. We need to figure out how to let people belong and how to let people be a part of us and how to take interest in, in what we're doing and, and help them. And then maybe pretty soon they're starting to, they're coming to church and they're starting to sing the songs and they're starting to learn how to pray and they're, and they're starting to learn what the Bible means. And, and I've had so many people say, I try to read the Bible, but I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I fully get that. So we help them and we unpack it and we say, but this is, you know, this is what that part means. Or let's read this together. Or let's figure this out. Or, 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 or let's add a little bit. And once you learn this little piece, then this little piece will start making sense too. And we start letting people believe, uh, behave and, and, and change and grow. It's, what is it? We're cultivating within them the fruits of the Spirit as the journey goes along. You see, we have a certain strength in our knowledge of the Scriptures. We have a strength in walking with the Spirit. We have a strength in living out this Christian life. And so we need to be gentle with others that don't. And from our strength, help them along the path. And how did he do that? Well, the, the, the gardener, I don't know, that's an easier word than vine dresser. <laughs> the gardener comes along and he says, what does he say? He says, hey, I'll, I'll dig around it, I'll fertilize, and I'll give it a little more patience. And he wants to cultivate this within the tree. There are two kind of, there's two different groups, if you will, but they have a similar agenda. And, and, and think about what we just talked about in the Believe behave and belong scenario in two different ways. One is that first kind of church I'm talking about. And in and, and that kind of church, um, maybe they, they've got their beliefs right, but they're kind of cold and they're kind of closed off and, and, and they're, they're leery of allowing visitors to come in. But let's say a guest shows up, their car breaks down right in front of the church and they walk in the building or something. It's probably the only reason a visitor would come to this kind of church. And they walk in the door, and, and, they, and they, they walk in, and they, and they talk to them and say, you know, I, I have a lot of problems in my life. Uh, you know, what do you think about me coming in and, and being here? The, the response is going to be something a little bit along the lines of, I mean, they, they may say it, they may not say it. Um, sometimes it gets said. But say, if there's, you know, you don't belong here if there's something wrong with you. And people leave. It, it might be spoken or it might just be in actions or it might be in, in the systems of the church. 
But one way or another, they say that their reply is, if you have problems, you don't belong here. Now, there's a second kind of a group. Now, this kind of group says that they're representing God. They say they're worshiping God. They're seeking God. They want to do God's work. Then think of a recovery-type ministry who also says we're seeking God, we're trying to do God's work, and we're trying to help other people know uh, how God can work in their lives. And a person walks into that group, into re- like an AA group or a Celebrate Recovery or a divorce support group or something like that, some kind of recovery program or some kind of recovery group, and somebody walks into that group and says, you know what, I have problems. What do they say? Welcome, Harry. You're in the right place. Come on in. That, that, uh, that first group, if somebody comes, if they walk in and they come in and they, they, they know how to, how to demonstrate that, you know, they, they put the smile on, they're all cleaned up, they bring their family and everything looks perfect and wonderful and they walk in and they say, you know what, I have nothing wrong with me. What does the church say? Great, welcome, you come right on in and join us. But you're never going to grow. You're never going to heal. You're never going to have the opportunity to allow God to fix and work on what's going on inside. What you're thinking about when you lay your head down on the pillow at night. Now what happens if they walk into this room and somebody says, hey, I'm just here to check it out, but there's really nothing wrong with me. Well, they've got a reply for that too. It's called denial. Everyone has work that needs to be done. And the point is in that recovery group, in that support group, they're following the biblical model of James chapter 5 that says that all of us have to do the work of digging around in our heart and digging around in our life, digging around in our hurts, our habits, and our hangups to figure out why we do what we do. And it says that we should pray, the elders should be praying for the sick. And it says that we should be gathering together and and talking through what's going on. It even says that we should be confessing our sins to one another and praying for each other. You see, sometimes you've got to dig and find out what's bothering you. Why do you act the way you act? How come the fruit isn't growing in your life? And then they fertilize it with the Spirit of God through patience and prayer and support and advocating for one another. They give time for the fruit to grow. That's what it means to be gentle. To be willing to find people in your life that you can approach and they will find you approachable so that when they're misbehaving, when they're misunderstanding, when they're, they don't have it all figured out yet, we can step in and advocate for them and say to the Father, give them a little more time. Give them to me. I'll help. Now, there's no guarantee that the fruit is going to grow. There's no guarantee that the owner's not going to come back next year and cut down the tree anyways but it's the best chance for it to happen. The best opportunity when we know how to be gentle with people to move into their lives and say, you know what, I'm I'm here and I'm messed up too and we're going to figure this out and try to see if fruit will grow in your life. I'll bet you everyone has had somebody like that in their life. That everyone here has had someone like that in your life that was patient with you, that saw something in you when you didn't see it in yourself, that, was, that had enough strength to overlook your failures and be patient and give you a little more time and speak into your life and urge you to do better and to be better. But everyone here had somebody that spoke in your life and encouraged you in the ways of the Lord taught you the scriptures, showed you how to live like Jesus. And everyone in here is called to be that kind of advocate through the spirit of gentleness in someone else's life. Let's pray.